Uh, just on behalf of the uh, Physiological Society, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. Um, I've got the role of trying to chair this evening's session. And we really want the evening to be an evening of conversation and discussion. So we've got two wonderful speakers who will provide some input. And then I will play the role of trying to facilitate a conversation uh, with me butting in and asking them some questions uh, and getting you guys to also make some comments and ask some questions. Um, making meaning of stress. Uh, I am fascinated by that title. And I'm fascinated by that title because of, of what I do in my life. Uh, I have a very simple purpose in life. And that purpose is to ensure that one day everybody in the working world feels that they've got the choice to put their hand up and ask for help if they are suffering from depression or anxiety. So I want people in the working world to one day know that they've got the choice. Because today, they've got the choice when it comes to a physical illness. They will put their hand up and they will ask for help if they're suffering from any physical illness. But if it's a mental illness, they won't. Why? Because there's such a stigma associated with depression and anxiety, particularly in the working world. And that passion and sense of purpose comes out of me spending 25 years working for Unilever in a very senior HR role, having my own experience or my own crucible moment in 2008 when I got very sick with depression. But what saved my life in 2008 was a decision that I took which was not to be burdened by the stigma. And in not being burdened by that stigma, I asked for help, support, and guess what I got? All the love, support, and encouragement to get better. And I got better. And then in 2012, a very good friend of mine committed suicide. And he was the sort of person, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. He brought light to everybody's life. But nobody knew he was ill. And he was so ill that he could tell nobody. And eventually he took his own life. And I lay in bed that night and I thought to myself, stigma has just killed a friend of mine. That's not fair. Because had it been any physical illness, he would have got the help and support and he'd still be alive today. But because it was depression, he couldn't ask for help because he was so burdened by the stigma. And so I'm fascinated by this concept of the meaning of stress. Because in many ways, I think stress is a good thing. It gets me out of bed in the morning. If I'm going to do a cycle race, it helps me to ride a little bit quicker. And so, better understanding the meaning of stress, and when stress might become distress and become an illness, I'm fascinated by that. And so I'm really looking forward to listening to uh, Gail and to Stafford give us some of their perspectives on this issue around stress. Um, stress can sometimes, it can sometimes be a more acceptable word to use while you're covering up the fact that you're actually ill and that you might be suffering from depression or anxiety. But I'll use the word stress because it's more acceptable. And so I'm fascinated to hear what, uh, what the professors are going to, to say this evening. So on my right, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Gail Kin Kinman. Hi. Um, Gail is a professor of occupational health uh, Psycho and psychology, a director of research for the applied psychology at the University of Bedfordshire. She's also a chartered psychologist. She's an associate fellow of the British Psychological <coughs> Society. She's the founder of a working group within that society which looks at work-life balance. And a lot of her work is related to stresses in stress in what we would call high-stressed working professions. Nursing, teaching, etc., etc. So that's what Gail does and what she is. But I would like her to just take a few minutes just to tell us a little bit more about herself. Oh, gosh, that's, a, that's an interesting question, really. Personally, you mean? Yes, of course. Okay, right. Well, um, 
I came to education very late. I was uh, a secretary, I was an administrator until I was 32. And then my husband died very young of cancer and my mortgage was paid and I could do anything I wanted to do in terms of a career. So I wanted to be a social worker. I went along to the university and I said I want to do social work and they said, oh that's a shame, the course is full. Have you thought about psychology? And I said, okay then. <laughs> Basically that was the start of my career. And then I kind of really liked it and started doing well and um, got interested in stress because, you know, I'm from, I'm from South Wales and I'm from a very strong socialist background and um, I think it's very, very important to fight for terms and conditions, you know, improve terms and conditions of, of employees, particularly in the so-called emotionally demanding jobs, in the helping professions. Um, it's never more important than now because these people are working under increasing demands and reducing resources and you know it's a very very difficult and challenging time so this is why we need to really work hard to uh, make make things better better for them thanks Gail. So that's okay me. so we're going to hear a little bit more from Gail just now and then on my left I've got uh, Professor Stafford Lightman uh, professor of medicine at the University of Bristol He's also the president of the British Neuroscience Association and his research is very much in this whole area of stress and the mechanisms of stress. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Professor, or oh, if I can call so you please, Stafford, please. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Stafford who's going to just spend 15 minutes and talk a little bit about stress, the mechanisms of stress. We'll then hand over to Gail, she'll do the same, and then I'll open it up for some questions. So let's get through the presentations, and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions. Thank you. Okay, well, I was asked just to tell you a little bit about my background first as well. And uh, actually, I, I came on a slightly unusual background too. Uh, I was always interested in the brain, uh, but actually I started life as an anthropologist. And uh, I did field work in central Mato Grosso in Brazil and in the Mantuai Islands off the south coast of Sumatra. And in fact, I don't have quite the same experiences as you, but I have experiences of being ill in a large longhouse in, uh, in an island off uh, Sumatra. And uh, I, in fact, it was a very interesting bit of public health because I had a very high temperature, uh, very extremely painful sore throat, and I was really quite ill. And everybody in that community, uh, all day long, there's always one person who came and lay with me, and put their arms around me, and made me feel better. Yeah. And I, it was amazing. Also, I, you know, there was the witch doctor went out and collected lots of herbs and various things. And I got better. I do have to admit I also took some antibiotics, but you know, that's, be that as it may, the feeling of being loved and cared for by a whole community was an incredibly powerful one. And it's something that uh, has lived with me for a long time. I then went back into clinical medicine. Uh, I was interested in the brain. At that time, I was interested in the, how the brain was controlled by hormones. And so I was interested in the interface between hormones and the brain. And stress is one of the major components uh, of the way circulating things in the blood can affect the way we think, the way our emotions work, and what we do. So this is uh, really, I'm giving Gail's talk at the moment, which I'm probably not <laughs> going to do terribly well at, but it's, if, so long as you promise to do mine, I'll do yours. Okay. okay? Make it interesting, won't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is uh, Banks's idea of what stress is. And uh, I don't know if any of you ever <laughs> went to that, but it was just a brilliant performance anyway. So um, this is Hans Selye, and this is the father of stress. And uh, he did his MD in Prague, then he moved to Montreal, and he was basically the first person who started the whole concept of stress being something that uh, was bad for you or did something to you. And in fact, what he, one of his first major papers was this, and this was called The Physiology and Pathology of Exposure to Stress. And what he called it was, he didn't, to begin with actually, he didn't call it stress, he called it the General Adaptation Syndrome, 
basically meaning when something nasty happened to you, your body adapted to that, and it was the way your body adapted to that that made you better. But then he coined the word stress for this. And his first paper basically showed what happened when you were stressed. And uh, on the left is a normal animal, and on the right is, an, is a stressed animal. All I'll show you is a normal animal. This is the size of the adrenal glands in a normal animal. You'll see the adrenal glands in an animal that is stressed are much bigger. This is the thymus, and that is actually a little, an immune gland that's in the chest. And so your immune system, when you're stressed, gets, your, gets uh, smaller. So your thymus goes from that size to that side. So your, you suppress your immune system. Your thymus gets smaller. If you look at lymph nodes, which are another part of your immune system, that's their normal size, and when you're stressed they get smaller. And this is the lining of the stomach. So normally the lining of the stomach looks really very nice like this, and I don't know if you can see it, but there are lots of little red bits here, and those are all ulcers. And so his concept was that if you stress an animal badly, you, you suppress their immune system, you increase the size of their adrenals, and you get nasty things happening like getting ulcers. So what actually happens in stress? What happens to you? Well, basically, stress is perceived in the brain. You can't have a stressor unless you perceive it. Stress isn't something. It doesn't mean anything. Actually, what it is is something your body perceives as being bad, and you need to adapt to it. So your brain perceives a stress. Then what it does is that it sends messages, first of all, down your brainstem, down your spinal cord, to nerves that go to your adrenal glands and to your adrenal medulla, and your adrenal medulla releases adrenaline. So the first thing that happens in the fight or flight response, when, when you jump on your, off your bungee rope or whatever it is, you feel, oh my god, it's the release of adrenaline, and that's the fight or flight response. But at the same time, this same part of the brain here makes another little hormone that activates your pituitary gland. It makes a hormone that goes all the way around the body. It's called ACTH. It goes all the way around the body. And it goes to the outside of your adrenal gland. So this acts on the outside of the adrenal gland. And it, this adrenal gland then makes what are called glucocorticoids. So there are two things made by your adrenal glands. There is the adrenaline made by the medulla in the middle, the adrenal medulla, and there's the glucocorticoids that are made by the outside of the adrenal gland. And that's what your hormonal response to stress is, a very rapid response from adrenaline and a later response of these glucocorticoids, which are very important uh, hormones to allow you to adapt to that stress. But just in case you think that I think everything is related to hormones, it isn't. Because that same part of the brain here that responds to stress, and I'm talking about a part called the amygdala, this part of the brain does lots of other things. It makes you feel anxious. So if you stress somebody, you feel anxious. And it sends lots of nerve fibers to different parts of the brain, to the parts of the brain that, that are activated that make you feel anxious. And that happens within the brain. But in addition to that, it does a lot of other things. And a really interesting paper that came out in January this year from Roger Pittman's lab showed that activation of the amygdala in the brain actually activates your bone marrow. Your bone marrow releases a whole load of cells which circulate around the body. And these cells have lots of inflammatory mediators in them. And they actually act on your blood vessels to cause your blood vessels to have what's called atheroma. They get inflamed. And that causes cardiac disease. So stress can do all sorts of things. It's not only through hormones, but through the nervous system. It can activate all sorts of things which can theoretically be nasty for you. But I think we need to be really careful because the word stress is a, an impossible word to define and it means very different things to different people. So I think we need to realize that stress is basically good for you. It is adaptation. So over evolution, we have, lear we, stress has, uh, we have learned to respond to stress in a way that is in our interest. So if you're walking down Oxford Street, and a double-decker bus or a lion or a saber-toothed saber tiger or something appears down Oxford Street, you're going to want to run away. And what's going to be important to you? You want to be vigilant. So if you see a lion coming, you're going to want to see where there's a tree that you can climb. You want to see how you can escape. 
So vigilance is increased. And, and one of the things that happens in stress is you have increased vigilance. Your memory, your acute memory, goes up. Now, uh, you know, you will remember what happened on nine, what, uh, where you were and what you did at 9-11. It was such a stressful event that actually it activated your memory and you will remember where you are and what you were doing. So if you're stressed, it activates your memory. And that, of course, is really important because if the lion, if you survive and you see a lion again, you will learn from the previous occasion what had happened and you'll be more likely to escape. So it's good for you. Acute stress puts up your heart rate. It increases the amount of blood that goes to your muscles. If you want to run away, that's a good thing. It helps you escape. It puts up the adrenaline, actually puts up your blood sugar, so you've got more fuel to help you escape. All of these things are good. Stress is actually good for you. And that's something that you need to bear in mind. In the short term, that is something that you actually want. The problem happens when you have long-term stress. And so, if you're in the middle of divorce proceedings, or if your firm is downsizing, if you've got mortgage arrears, or if you've got teenage children, or if you've got all of those, or if you have all of these and it goes on for a prolonged period of time, that's when you have a problem. And it causes all sorts of symptoms and all sorts of problems. It can cause depression, anhedonia, that basically means that nothing's enjoyable. All the things that you know, you'd enjoy most of the time, you don't, it just doesn't, doesn't mean anything to you. You have a lack of, you lose your sex drive, you, you're sleeping badly, you feel anxious, you get various diseases, so you get coronary artery disease, you can get heart attacks, you get high blood pressure, and you can get metabolic syndrome, by which I mean uh, you can get diabetes or diabetes-like syndromes, and you get suppression of your immune system. So this is what happens if you have, if you, if you have a stress, prolonged stress over a long period of time. So is there, what, what do we really want to know? What we really want to know is we all begin basically the same. And some of us turn out happy, and some of us turn out not so happy. And what is it? What's going on, and what is it that determines whether we turn out into adults who have a happy life or an unhappy life? Well, I think the important thing is that it's no one single thing. You can't blame one thing. And a real take-home message is that there are multiple issues, all of which will affect you. So first of all, your genes. All of us have a large set of genes, and some of us are more predisposed to getting depression, to be being stressed than others. So there is a contribution from your genes. There's contribution from your childhood experience. There's a huge amount of in interest in this at the moment, but experiences that happen to you as a small child have a massive effect on you for the rest of your life. So if really nasty things to happen to you as a child, and you've become a very insecure child, you'll become a very insecure adult, and you'll be much more liable to get symptoms related to this later on in your life. And finally, there's stress as an adult. So if you're an adult and you have all of those things I showed you before, that's also a risk factor. So what's really important is all of these things matter. If one on their own isn't really going to matter, you're going to be fine. But if you have a combination of poor genes plus a poor childhood experiences, and then you're stressed as an adult, then you are very likely to have uh, nasty effects may and probably become, uh, become depressed. So finally, is there any hope if you're down that, down that line? Is there any hope that we, anyone can do anything about it? Now, I'm not uh, a, a uh, I don't treat patients who have got problems, but I just want to mention just a study we did quite a long time ago to see whether we could treat stress-induced immune disease. And so basically what we did was this. We looked at people that we were thought were as stressed as people could possibly be. And the most stressed people we could think of were the spousal carers of patients with dementia. Not the people with dementia, but the people, their husbands or wives, who looked after them. So they're looking after people who they know for a very long period of time are going to be unwell, and there's no cure, there's nothing, there's, nothing, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. 
and we compared them with some normal controls and we very simply what we did was we gave them a flu jab and we looked at their immune response to a flu jab so this is the response of normal people here non-carers just ordinary people of the same age that they're all elderly so the response isn't terribly good but that's normal people but the people who were carers had half the response their immune system just didn't work as well so then we thought well we'd do something about this and so basically what we did was we did the same thing again we looked at normal people here the controls they had a, a poor, not very good response, but a reasonable response to the flu jab. The, the carers had a very poor response, but then, and half of those carers, we g actually gave, uh, we intervened and gave them uh, psychological support, and they had a much better response. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the mechanisms behind this, but just saying that you can help people. This is not, not a one-way street. There are things that can be done and there are things that can be done to help or diminish or decrease the chances of being ill. So the bottom line is, what is stress? Well, you can have physical stress, I mean something nasty can happen to you. You can have a major operation or something like that, which is a physical stress, or the psychological stress, which in many cases is what we're more interested in. So they will all be acting on your brain. But your brain also will have certain genes in it which will make you more or less susceptible to the effects of those stress. You will also have early life experiences which again will make you more or less susceptible to getting the stress. And then finally, the context. If you're stressed, something nasty happens to you, but you're in a lovely environment, you're on a desert island and you've got lots of lovely food and beautiful people around you, if something nasty happens to you, it's not going to be too bad because you, you, you know, it's going to be nice. But if you have just been sacked from your job and you've got no money and then something nasty happens to you, that context will make it worse. So it's a combination of all of these things which will have an effect on you. And it'll affect your behavior and it'll affect your hormones and the way you, the, the way you act. And just to get ahead, because I do want to stress that in the short term, these stresses can be adaptive, they can be useful for you, but in the longer term, they're maladaptive, and those are the, thing, those, those are the times when it's going to make you unwell. So, thank you. Thank you. Right, I need to find my... This one? Yes, I'm assuming. Well, thank you very much, Stafford, for a really interesting talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking about something which is a very specific form of stress, but sadly very, very common indeed. And again, you know, drawing on what Stafford said about the difference between acute and chronic stress, this is very, very, very chronic. Uh, so the research that I am going to be talking about and the evidence is based on long term uh, work related stress. Okay, now, um, as Stafford mentioned, it's very, very difficult to define stress. And certainly, um, somebody once said, uh, if you ask 100 experts, you will get 100 different answers. And therein lies the problem. So this is uh, a definition from the Health and Safety Executive. And believe it or not, they took about four or five years to agree to this definition. They consulted lots of different people, you know, trade unions, uh, scientists, um, employees in general, and, and they came up with this. And, it, you know, we feel that it's actually a really good definition because it captures this subjective notion of what stress is and how it is perceived. So it's seen as a process uh, that arises where work demands of various types and combinations exceed your capacity and ability to cope. Now, in other words, in simple terms, it's an imbalance between the demands made on you and the resources that you have. Very, very subjective. Um, and everybody will have a different set of resources. You will have internal resources, which may be hardiness, uh, coping skills, etc., cetera, uh, temperament or personality. Um, or they can be external, which like social support, etc., and a caring, caring background, which really fits in with what Stafford was saying. 
So I just want to start off by looking at the health and safety executives um, research. Now they run the same survey yearly apart from one year. Now pr any prizes for the, for the gap in the data and I have absolutely no idea why they didn't um, get data that year. So you can see the prevalence and the incidence of work related stress. Now um, the question is are you suffering from work related stress or depression or anxiety caused by work? Now this isn't you know, general depression and anxiety or low mood, this is specifically caused by work. And previous research has verified this by getting data from GPs, so people aren't exaggerating or making it up. Really speaking, there is evidence that they were minimizing it rather than, you know, um, exaggerating it. So we can see, you know, that there's a, um, a fluctuation in general in terms of the prevalence and incidence, but, you know, very, very high number of cases. And it's really good that the uh, this is being monitored. And in some ways you can see the after effects of what happens in terms of perhaps the uh, um, uh, austerity measures, etc., because it will always lag behind. So, you know, it's a general overall picture. But what about some facts and figures? Now, um, you know, there are lots and lots of figures sort of bandied around in terms of the cost of stress, and they sound very, very dramatic indeed. So, 11.7 million days. Uh, working days lost, and an average of maybe 24 days per case, um, which is down to stress-related illness. 37% of all work-related health cases, sorry, ill health cases, are down to uh, work-related stress, and it causes almost half of all sickness absence. So, you know, that is a massive cost to the economy and to individuals. Uh, over the years, we've seen that it's much more prevalent in the so-called helping professions, you know, the jobs that I tend to look at in terms of education, health, etc., but also in defence. Now, that's probably not going to be a great surprise to you in terms of, you know, the stress of actually being in armed combat. But it's also f more frequent in nurses. Midwives, believe it or not, are one of the most stressed jobs that you can get. Um, teachers and welfare professionals. So it's looking at general patterns and how they, they may change over the years. Now, you may be surprised to see that perhaps it's more common in larger organisations and perhaps we can talk a bit about that later. Um, and estimates of the financial burden, now this is a paper that's been recently written by some colleagues of mine. They've looked at um, studies conducted on the cost of stress in about 12 countries. And there's a massive, massive estimation here between 221 million to 187 billion. Now, I just want you to think for a second about the difficulty of quantifying stress. Really, really difficult. Now, if you do the type of job that is in production and you paint faces on toy soldiers, let's say, or put widgets in phones or whatever, if you're off sick and you don't do it, you can quantify the loss of your labor, can't you? But for a lot of us, for an increasing proportion of us, given that you know we're not a, a manufacturing country any longer, we're working in jobs where working below par and our memory problems, our problem-solving abilities, and our creativity is going to impair our job performance. And it's really, really impossible to quantify that. So the difficulty is, you know, we're always going to be underestimating, aren't we, the costs of stress. So when you see these figures, it's really important to take them with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But what we do have to acknowledge is stress is extremely costly indeed. So I'm going to be looking quickly now at the, the costs of stress to individuals, to organizations, and to society. And I'm not going to be talking about money. I'm going to be talking about, you know, the real physical and mental and performance related costs. So first of all, as Stafford said, you know, we've, had a, we've got a range of physical health problems based around uh, you know, the, the fight and flight response that can range from you know, minor problems like headaches, etc., skin rashes, right the way to coronary heart disease and hypertension. Stress has also been linked with gum disease. It's practically every disease process that you can have. It will have some kind of impact. Secondly, mental health, depression and anxiety, but also things like self-esteem and self-confidence, you know, chipping and eroding away at these really important things. 
Our social health is likely to be affected. And, you know, what some people tend to do when they're experiencing work-related stress is they withdraw from other people. They hide away. They want to crawl into their cave because it's a way of recovery. It's a way of recovering from the demands. Whereas other people may become hostile and aggressive. And, of course, both of these things insulate people away from sources of support that they really need. You know, and as a psychologist, the most important buffer of work-related stress is social support. So if you're alienating other people, you're not likely to get this support, which is you know, going to be a, be a problem. And fourthly, uh, cognitive health. And as I mentioned, you know, in terms of your memory, your problem solving, and your creativity. And you're much more likely to have um, minor errors and slips, and slips and lapses at work, but also uh, major, major errors. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. What about organisations? Now, it's been very much linked to absenteeism, which I mentioned in an earlier slide. But I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that presenteeism is much more common when people are stressed. Now, this is a, a kind of a new term, but what it really means is people continue to work while they're sick enough to take time off. And that can be an absolutely major problem because they don't get better um, in the end, they're likely to suffer a health breakdown and they will take more time off. And it's a particular problem in uh, safety critical industries, we've found, because people are much more likely to make errors. They're responsible for the well-being of other people. And a really interesting study done by a colleague of mine was looking at presenteeism in pharmacists. And people who were working while sick made significantly more prescription errors. Now, that's going to be a really serious uh, outcome for lots of people. It's uh, very much more common in the so-called helping professions, too, and the safety-critical professions. And uh, low commitment to motivation. You know, you feel like you couldn't be bothered, um, you know, to, to do the things in organisations that perhaps a little bit extra, you know, so organisations suffer uh, for that reason. And very importantly, litigation costs. Um, cases of, for compensation for work-related stress are quite high, although there's a whole raft of, of you know, qualifying factors that people have to meet. But, you know, obviously, organisations uh, want to avoid that, and they will be seen publicly as, as bad employers. You know, so lots of reasons for managing stress. But what about society? And this is something that isn't often looked at, and we feel that it's particularly important. People who are off sick, people who medically retire, cost the NHS a lot of money. So we're talking about healthcare costs, we're talking about medication. There's also uh, social care costs because work-related stress is the second most common cause uh, of early retirement next to musculoskeletal problems. So it's a massive cost to the country. There's cost in the terms of individual families it's likely to um, be linked with relationship breakdown. And there is also evidence that stress and depression and anxiety in parents will transmit itself to children. Um, community involvement and engagement. People may not have time to be involved in community activities, but they may become overly apathetic and cynical. And, you know, this feeling, oh, well, nothing I do which will make a difference, which is a bit like learned helplessness. Um, okay. So what, what about the types of jobs, uh, sorry, the job features that are most stressful? Now, the health and safety executive has kind of quantified and measured these aspects of work for quite some time. And there are six aspects of job that they see as being really relevant to all different types of work. So jobs that have high demands or high workload. Secondly, jobs that are low in control, low autonomy. You have little influence over the pace of your work. You may have little influence over your working hours and when you can take breaks. You may not even be able to take breaks. Low support from your managers and also from your co-workers, really important. Role ambiguity. Now, this is where you really don't know what your role is. Your role in the organization or in your working group. You know you've got to do something, but you're not quite sure what it is. Now, all of the roles that we perform have got a series of demands attached to them. And these demands have got the 
potential to conflict. Like if you are, uh, you have to do a, a presentation at work and you've got a sick child. So you have this, this decision to make um, and the demands associated with the two roles will conflict. Very, very uh, common source of stress. Ineffective management of change. Now this is something I've been looking at recently and it's something called change fatigue where changes are so extreme and people have to adapt so quickly that they're kind of becoming very apathetic about change. And they may be really negative about changes that will improve their working lives because they just can't, can't be bothered. So management of change, communication of the reasons for change, really, really important, involving staff in the process of change. And finally, poor quality interpersonal relationships. You know, this looks at things like the general culture of relationships at work, but also more serious things like bullying and harassment. So these are the, the general job features. But there are working conditions. You know, the, uh, the research that I do, we, we look at models of stress and the combinations of factors that are more likely to be particularly toxic to individuals. Now, you know, going back many, many years, um, it's been known that a typically high-stress job is one that combines high demands with low control and low support. Socially isolated. You have a lot of demands made upon you. You have no control over how you meet these demands. So this model has been used in the Whitehall studies. Has anybody come across that? For many, many years. And it reliably predicts coronary heart disease, depression, and hypertension. So, you know, and the interesting thing is the stereotype of the typical high stress person tends to be the executive. But actually, what the Whitehall studies have taught us is it's people low down in the organizational hierarchy that are more at risk because they're more likely to have low control. So, that is a big issue. Jobs that where the efforts that you believe to put in, sorry, the efforts that you believe you put in your job are not counterbalanced by the rewards. Now, rewards are not just money. You know, we work for lots of different reasons. Rewards are respect, esteem, job security. And provided they're in balance, we're not likely to feel stress. Now, we may be prepared to sacrifice pay for respect and esteem and the feeling of doing a good job. So that's really, really important too. Uh, the work that I do looking at high emotional demanding jobs. Now, at the moment, there is a requirement you know, for, for people like nurses, social care workers, to deliver compassionate care. You know, we need to be more compassionate. Uh, the Francis report you know, made it very clear that you know, there were very high profile failures of care. Very, very distressing and, and horrible uh, uh, for people and their families. But actually, it comes at a cost to individuals who are supposed to deliver this care. So if they don't have the support that they need, if they don't have the ability to talk about it to professionals who are impartial, that's going to be extremely stressful. Insecure and precarious work, you know, we all know that's become much more common um, and it has a lot of uh, negative effects. And there is evidence that even by listening to reports of job losses on the television or the radio can actually increase the physiological stress response. So, you know, we are uh, very important. Jobs that aren't flexible, that are very rigid, and also um, jobs that have long working hours and poor work-life boundaries. You know, we've known for decades that long hours do not predict good performance. In fact, it's the other way around. But people seem to be very reluctant to acknowledge that. Um, and also, the more time you spend working, the less time you have to recover and you know, to spend time on hobbies and interests that kind of replenish you. So that's really important too. Um, so finally, I want us to consider the new threats to well-being because actually we can't just rely on old research. The world of work is changing all of the time. Society is changing. We're much more reliant on information communication technology that poses a great threat to us in lots of ways. It can help us be very flexible and work wherever, whenever we choose and to be more productive. But equally, it can be toxic because it can make work more salient at all times. And, you know, in the words, that, in the terms that people are using now, we can be always on and that can be a big problem. 
So organisations aren't very good at, man at helping people manage that at the moment. So there is evidence that we're not necessarily working longer, but we're working in a more intensified type of way. The pressure for rapid response and lack of thinking time is, is a big problem. Zero hours contracts. Now obviously the flexibility of those may be one way. They may be one way in terms of the organization, but not necessarily for the individual who may have to um, you know, care for children. And also, have you all come across this term, the gig economy? Yeah? yeah. You know, it's where people are picking up small um, jobs or maybe short-term jobs. Now, that's absolutely brilliant, provided you're very, very good at self-managing your time and your well-being. Now, what happens if work isn't so plentiful and the time that you would put by, you know, to recover from your previous job, you take on more work? So, you know, um, people being expected to self-manage can be problematic uh, without any, any support. Increasingly high self-expectations to be able to cope with change and to be able to cope with high demands and intensification as well. And people feeling, you know, and I think this taps into what Jeff was saying, that a reluctance to disclose that you're not coping. The feeling that you have to be perfect. You have to be a perfect parent, a perfect employee as well. And you have to be really fit, <laughs> too. Um, and, you know, the, the stress, of, uh, sorry, the stigma of stress is still so great that it's very difficult to disclose that. The research that I've done suggests that around about 50% of people in all types of work, including medicine, people will not disclose that they are experiencing stress. In fact, medical students would rather make up a physical health problem than say they're suffering from depression and anxiety. Now that is really, really shocking, isn't it? Okay, um, agile working, now that's a, a kind of new term for flexible working, um, and I think I've covered that in terms of um, communication technology. Overly high job involvement. Now it's wonderful to love your job, but it's not so good if your job is central to everything. Because when people face retirement, it's really hard for them to step back. And of course, it may be very good in the short term, because we find it's great for job satisfaction in the short term, but in the longer term, the lack of opportunities to recover can be problematic for health. And finally, social isolation. And that's something that you know a lot of what we do um, can um, cause loneliness unless we try to integrate, you know, purposely try to spend time with other people. And, you know, there is evidence now that, that these so-called hubs where people who are working at home who can come in maybe twice a week and engage with other people uh, can be very um, um, effective. So finally, you know, we need evidence-informed systemic interventions. Unfortunately, in the world of stress, there's a lot of charlatans about and they do not necessarily use evidence-informed interventions. You know, there's some really good interventions out there, as Stafford uh, mentioned, uh, cognitive behavioral strategies. But you know, we would argue that it has to start at the top. There has to be a recognition that some jobs are very demanding, and there has to be support in place. Organizations need to destigmatize stress and also recognize that long hours don't necessarily mean an ideal worker teams and work groups as well offering support but also individuals do need these strategies because you know the world of work is changing and will continue to change and there will be demands so learning strategies of coping with with um, excuse me <coughs> the demands of work uh, will also be essential but you know interventions are needed at all of these different points to be effective okay thank you Great, thank you, um, Stafford, and thank you for that. Um, I mean, I, I, th I loved your, I mean, just the simplicity of your presentation. And I think, Gail, just some of, you know, some of what you talk about is, somebody once said to me, the best innovation is the innovation that's the most obvious. <laughs> you know, so think of a paper clip. <laughs> you know, or think of a sticky that you stick up, or think of what Dyson is now bringing to the world. These are real obvious innovations. Um, 
and a, and a lot of what you say it just makes so much so much sense, uh, particularly from the world that I I come from. I just want to start with just a couple of questions. Um, so maybe the first one to you, Stafford, which is a little bit around. Um, so if if stress and your propensity to be maybe move from be, being stressed to becoming depressed or anxious is driven by things like um, genes, um, your kind of childhood, which maybe you can't do too much about. And then you were talking about stresses as an adult, as an adult. What is it that, what is it that we should be doing in terms of how we're living our lives? If two of those things are kind of, or a lot of them are out of our control, what should we be doing to better manage our stress? I think it's an awareness. <clears throat> and, and if you've got these susceptibilities, uh, and it's, uh, well, a lot of it's societal, of course, but as far as the individual is concerned, if you are aware of this propensity, then you don't want to put yourself in a position in which the, these particular stressful stimuli are going to occur. So in choosing the job, if, if you have the chance of choosing the job that you can do, mm -hmm. you should be choosing one which is not going to put you under all of these pressures. I mean, if, if you are aware that you are susceptible to having that problem, then you try and avoid situations which are going to push you there. But also just this, you know, this, this notion of awareness. I mean, I mean, if I just talk about my own experience, uh, you know, Aware, being aware of my emotions, I mean, and being a guy, <laughs> can't even spell the word emotion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and men just do not ever want to talk about emotions. Well. And so, learning to become aware of your emotions and what those emotions actually mean—it's it's very do difficult. Do we ever learn that stuff? No, we we don't. And women are much better at it, as you know, than men, because mainly because they talk to each other and they have large groups of friends and they discuss their problems and uh, they're mutually supportive and in general men are very bad at that they want their macho they don't want to admit if you don't admit that you've got a problem yeah. then the problem's much worse and so that that's part of it but what about even at even at school should we should we be teaching children about emotions and about recognizing I mean, I was with a guy the other day, he said to me, how many emotions do you think there are? And I said, oh, maybe about 20, 30. He said, no, I have, I have spoke 345 different emotions. Quite I mean, so come on, I mean, so why do we never get going? Why, why are we not, why isn't this in schools? Why aren't we teaching children, young adults, about emotions and their emotional and mental health? Right, well, I think some schools are. Some schools are introducing yeah. um, something called, that I'm sure you've all heard of, emotional intelligence, emotional literacy, and that's seen as really important life skill. And it should be, I, I quite agree with you, it should be seen as important as you know, the usual kind of maths and English, etc., because these are transferable skills that will help you all the way through your life. Self-knowledge, self-care, you know, this is something that I found in my own research, self-care yeah. is very poor, especially in the helping jobs. Because people see other people's needs as more important. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you need to look after yourself in order to look after other people. It seems obvious, but actually people find it really, really hard to do. So starting young, very, very young indeed, I think is the, the important thing. But is there something about, well, we just didn't know what to teach? And is the science now we've kind of caught up where, where we could be teaching? Um, you know, when I was at school, I was taught physical education. PE, went out, I did all my <laughs> physical education. Nobody ever, ever taught me anything about mental education. Some, you know, I often coin the term mental hygiene. You know, somebody taught me dental hygiene. My mother or my father. Guess what? My teeth haven't fallen out. Nobody ever taught me any mental hygiene. Mm -hmm. And it led to my crucible moment in life. And so is it that we just, there's not enough, there wasn't, there isn't enough knowledge yet? to be able to teach this stuff? Uh, yes, there are a couple of schools that are doing it, but it's a couple. I mean, mm. you know, why isn't it in the curriculum? Why isn't it part of every single school should be teaching these, what you were talking about, these kind of techniques to begin to look after 
their emotional or mental health. Absolutely. But of course and is it because we just don't have the knowledge? Oh, we do have the knowledge. Absolutely we do. And, you know, we do our best to try to promote it to everybody that listen, because, you know, this is, this is what our job is. But sometimes people refuse to listen. Mm -hmm. And I think that hopefully, you know, we, we do need to be hopeful and optimistic. The culture is changing and people are realizing the importance of emotional intelligence because it isn't just the ability to manage and understand your own well-being and what you need. It's also to be able to manage relationships properly. So it's interpersonal and intrapersonal in lots of ways. But, you know, it's just, I guess, keeping up the pressure. I'm going to ask you one other question, and then I'd love to take some questions from the audience. And, and that is, um, my question is, um, for years and years, companies have invested huge amounts of money in health and safety. But where they've invested the money is in safety, not in the health of their employees, particularly the mental health. So if you take something like the construction industry in this country, there's one suicide every month in the construction industry in this country. One a month. And for years they've invested millions in safety. But not in the mental health of their people. Why are companies finding it so difficult to invest in what I would call the non-physical, the emotional and mental health agenda, whereas in the past they've done lots in safety and they've done quite a bit in physical uh, health. There are gyms in every office. Uh, they give you special rates to join Nuffield. Uh, they make sure their canteens are full of all the right nutrition. But why are they not prepared to make the same investment, do you think, bearing in mind what you are talking about in terms of kind of work-related and the drivers of depression and anxiety in the workplace is everything that you've been talking about. So why do you think they're not investing more like they have in, in, in safety? There are some examples of good practice, we do have to say that. You know, some organisations are, are good at it, but equally a lot aren't. And, and I think for the reasons that you say. You know, the evidence is overwhelming that yeah. if you look after your staff, they are the most important resource that you have. Yeah. For all of the different reasons, you know, it, it's cost, it's performance, yeah. it's being a good employer, it's being moral. And it's meeting your duty of care to your staff. They're not interchangeable little widgets, yeah. are they, when you think about it? But I think, historically, people are reluctant to get involved in per people's personal life, you know? It's like, this is, this, is, this is work, this is performance, we can talk to you about this, and this is, you know, your personal life. And managers aren't trained to do it. They can feel very, very awkward. You know, I'm going kind of even, even stronger than that. I mean, mm. you know, it's not just companies. The health service yeah. is actually going from bad to worse. And the reason it's going from bad to worse is that we used to have common rooms where we used to have lunch together. Yeah. Uh, the pressures of work are now such that we only grab a sandwich mm. and eat it on the way to our outpatient clinic. Mm. Nobody talks to each, no one talks to anyone else. There is no sense of belonging to an organization anymore. Mm. And so actually the sense of isolation amongst health workers, and we're talking about doctors now, yeah. mm -hmm. is actually yeah. worse than it's ever been. Absolutely. And certainly in my experience, the number of doctors who go off depressed has gone up hugely. Mm -hmm. So actually it's getting worse. So it's just not companies, it's society. Yeah. Yeah. And it's what's happening in society at the moment, which is the so problem. So just on that, uh, Stafford, and, and then I'll shut up. Um, uh, my question is, there's a bit of research that has recently come out of Duke University which has shown that 30 years ago, the average age of somebody being diagnosed with depression or anxiety was 30. Today, that age is 14. Gee. Is 14. What do you think, because you were talking about adult experiences, what do you think is happening with children that is, that is kind of raising the levels of stress and therefore moving them into levels of anxiousness? I think this is a very dangerous subject yes. because uh, there is an appreciation of stress and depression now that there wasn't before. I mean, what could have been worse than the Great Depression? I mean, the Great Depression was appalling to, to a huge percentage of the population, but no one talked about stress. 
or depression then. And so now we have the society and you open newspapers and the word stress is all over the place. Right. And so I think talking statistics like that, I don't know what they mean. I don't understand them yeah. and I don't believe them. So you don't think that we are seeing an increased incidence in anxiety, depression amongst young people? I'm see I certainly think we're seeing an increase in the diagnosis of it. Yes. But I don't know whether there's an increased incidence. Okay. But and what do you think some of the causes then are? Of the increased diagnosis yes. of it is because there's a hugely increased awareness of it. And the and the incidence? I don't know whether the incidence has changed. Right. I mean, I, I genuinely, it's mm -hmm. not my area, but mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's changed. I think you're right. You know, there, there is an increased awareness of it. And there's also an increased uh, tendency to pa pathologize things right. as well. You right. know, the, the DSM-5 mm -hmm. now in yeah. America, you know, there's a whole host of diagnoses of disorders. Is, isn't there one called oppositional? defines disorder or something Well, I'm not similar. a psychiatrist, but I think mm, I've heard of any it. Any psychiatrists here? <laughs> no. Oppositional disorder, where a child won't take orders from the parent, you know? Well, of course, that is quite common, really. So where is, where, where is normal behavior, you know, and how do you draw that line? And, and it's, it, it's kind of pathologizing. So it could be pathologizing unhappiness. You know, and although it, saying that, I do have a, a, a former student who's looking, a former PhD student who's looking at materialism in children. And that is a very, very important source of unhappiness. And social comparison, you know, I've got this, I haven't got that. And also a tendency to isolate yourself socially, you know, through the use of, overuse of computers, etc., technology, new ways of communicating. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. All I'm sure questions. there are lots of questions from the floor. I've got the mic, and if you've got a question, I, I, just please put your hand up, and I will give you the mic, uh, because this is being streamed through Facebook, so they need to be able to hear the question. Uh, or maybe I'll repeat the question, and then, um, and then give you um, the opportunity for the people here to ask, answer it. So maybe I'll just repeat the question. Yes, thank you. I read uh, well, in the newspaper, so I just follow up the research paper, I'm not sure. Fake but news. <laughs> there was a, a study in one of the Scandinavian countries recently where they reduced the working hours of mm. some nurses mm. and care home people was to six hours uh, rather than eight. And since their health improved and they felt better in themselves. But they eventually said at the end of the study, you know, it's just not economically viable. We can't afford to pay you what would be eight hours, the, what we would have paid you for eight mm. hours, and you'd work six, and we'd have to have more shifts, etc., etc. So although that's a nice model and everyone agreed at the end of it that it was a fantastic idea and that's how it should be, you know, it didn't stick because of the financial burden. So do you think there's ever going to be a situation where that will be a viable option and how, how do you think you overcome that economic burden? So can I just repeat the question? Mm. So the question is that, you know, there is this, one of the things that you were talking about is kind of overworked, long hours, and will that ever change? Uh, because is it economically viable for, for, for people to work less hours? Hmm. It depends on people's, whether people are prepared to take the pay cut. But what tends to happen, you know, there have been similar experiments in this country. Um, I think it was Liverpool City Council when people were uh, encouraged to go home on time, well, maybe, maybe four o'clock. I think it was, a, that's right, it, it was shorter working days. And of course the problem is a lot of people didn't want to do that because they knew that they had projects that they had to finish. So they were actually being physically forced out, out of the building. And they knew in the longer term, you know, they wouldn't be able to do the job that they had to do. And of course, I think what kind of taps into that also are these tokenistic things like email free Fridays. Because you may not look at your emails on Friday, but what happens on Monday? You're going to have double the amount, aren't you? So that may end up causing more stress. So I think it really needs more of a culture change and a, a, and a great deal of thought because Scandinavia has a much more socially aware society in lots of ways, you know. And whether that would work in this country, I really don't know. Yep. I mean, my, my response. I mean, my response to that would be, you know, I don't think that the working environment is going to get any easier. You know, I think we continue to, for as long as we drive the value of organisations um, 
on short-termism and quarterly results, uh, I think there will be always a cancer in organizations, irrespective of whether it's the NHS or a Unilever, which is called efficiency. So you're expected to do more with less. Mm -hmm. You're expected to do, you're expected to be kind of 24 seven now. You're expected to drive the costs out. And I don't see that changing in the short term. And so therefore, what I think we've got to be doing is investing more in giving people the techniques and the guidance of how to become more resourceful in this very demanding world. And be so I was just going to come to the comment on that. It was very much from what you, you were saying. A lot of this comes from the top, and the problem is the people at the top cope very well mm -hmm. because if they have problems, they can, you know, if they have a problem, they can actually say, well, I'll, you can deal with this and you can deal with that. And it goes down to the bottom of the pile where somebody can't actually get anybody else to do it for them and they can't cope, they're given something to do that they actually can't cope with. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, and the boss says, well, I, I, work, I work 10 hours a day, I don't see why everybody else shouldn't work 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. But actually, he gets an awful lot out of his 10 hours a day. He gets a lot of feedback and a lot of positive things he gets back for it. And a Whereas, lot more control yeah, as well. Yeah, uh, and he has yeah. total control. And the person at the bottom doesn't get anything back from it and has no control and gets told off. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's a real problem. No. The people at the top often forget about that. Yeah. You know, we talk about quality time. Well, actually, you may work, say, 12 hours a day, but if you actually have what it takes to actually enjoy your life outside work and, and bring people in to do your ironing for you, your cleaning, then you can live. Yeah. And you can work as well. Yes. I've often heard this argument about, well, I do 12 hours a day. You know, what's the problem? Exactly. But the other thing I... I I think is, is the NHS another example, 12 hour shifts for nurses. Yes. Right. Long shifts, strange work patterns. Mm. It's also bad for the patient experience. Absolutely. Because then you see the same nursing staff for a few days and then they switch over. The NHS brought that in presumably because of, of changeover, you know, the overlap between shifts, saving money. Mm. Somebody was looking at the balance sheet short term. Mm. And, and measuring everything in, in money mm. rather than actually in say something about social that. dimension. Mm. Which in a, in a way, if it works, ends up saving money. Yeah. I mean, that's the strange thing about it. And, and, and yet, sick organisations, as, as yes. they're called, there's so many. But I, I think your point about the 12-hour shifts is really, really interesting because ostensibly it was brought in <coughs> to help women with children because of course they're doing fewer shifts they're doing four shifts maybe four 12-hour shifts rather than five what, what the days to be nine hours eight eight yeah. or nine hours now of course um the problem is you have nobody can sustain that level of performance over 12 hours and you've also got the commuting time on top of that where pe in london now people may be living two hours away each side so, you know, you will, would you want to be that patient and, you know, the 11th hour, so to speak? Um, but, you know, there was, um, I think, <coughs> King's College are now trying to get a project together because I'm um, involved in it to evaluate that, to evaluate the impact of it uh, in lots of ways with patients and mm. with, with, with staff. It's, it's very important. It because I don't mm. think it's rocket science. Yeah. To actually, it's, it's common sense to actually realise that maybe we have to have the evidence. But mm. Yes, there are right. lots of studies before they introduce that about shift work. Mm. And shift work is very damaging. Absolutely. Well, stress. Absolutely. Well, mm. shift work is extremely damaging to your health per se, yeah. let alone the number of hours you do. Actually, doing shift work is extremely bad for you. Yeah. Are there any other thoughts, comments, questions? Thank you. To go on that last point, uh, do you as a panel think that a potential solution is for every organisation to try and achieve essentially a form of quantifiable productivity of their employees, whereby you're not looking at output relating to just extreme long hours, but you're instead saying you have output per hour? And if you can achieve that quantification, do you think that it could be a potential solution? 
organizations realize that their stress is truly their choice. That's your area. Oh, that's a really good question, but it's a really hard one to answer. Because it does depend on the type of job that you do um, and the intensity of how you do it, because the time is important, obviously. The time, the time spent working is time taken away from everything else, essentially. But also the strain caused by the job that you do, to the emotional strain, um, you know, and the fact that you may be ruminating and worrying about the job, you know. I, I can't see that happening at all. Um, but there again, you see, there is overwhelming evidence that longer hours is really bad for people over the longer term, and shifts, obviously, as well. So um, I think we probably have the evidence out there, but it's just making sure that people listen to it. So it's not really answering your question, but... Mm. I just found the point, the comment you just made uh, about quantifying the number of your part of the table seat per hour. Would that not cause more stress? Because then everybody would want to have to say, oh, we have to meet 10 deliverables per hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some days you might not feel up to it, so you But you know, it is being done in some types of work. You've got keystrokes, haven't you? People are assessing keystrokes, mouse movements, you know, to whether you're actually behind your computer or not. It's the new kind of sweatshop in lots of ways, isn't it? You know, but um, very difficult to do, yeah. And, and as you say, it can be a source of stress. I, I think organizations should begin to focus more on, um, less on productivity but I think they should be focusing more on what is it that they can do to enhance the energy of their people. I mean, energy, I think, is as important a driver of performance as our skills, knowledge, behaviors, and different experiences. You know, when, you're, when, the, when, the, when the battery to the torch is full, it, deem, it beams a very bright light. When that battery is flat, it beams no light. And I think what's happening in organizations today, people are just flat. They are flat. They are worn out. And so I think organizations should be putting more effort into, so what is it that enhances the energy of people? And then start talking about the drivers of well-being as a driver of individual performance and therefore organizational performance. And teaching people about the importance of physical health, emotional health, mental health, and having a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. And then they've got energy, and then they give more, and then the levels of productivity mm -hmm. go up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, so this concept of energy, I think, is becoming more and more important as a driver of individual performance. I hope this is not too off topic, but what about art, music, as like activities or interventions in the yeah. workplace to maybe reduce stress? Definitely. So the question is, what about, uh, what about you know, music, what about you know, arts as interventions that can enhance uh, the well-being of people in the workplace? Mm. Absolutely, I think I'm totally with you there, especially things that involve working together. You know, I'm not talking about these management adventure type of things where people have to stand in a freezing cold bog, you know, and build a raft or something. I'm talking about, <laughs> which, you know, has happened in the past. I'm talking about choirs. Because, you know, the whole thing about the, the program on television, about these, these choirs and communities, they can really make a huge difference to people. Because music is therapeutic, it's cathartic, it's a way of, you know, knowing other people as well and replenishing yourself. I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, one of the major things biologically is actually having a motivated work workforce. And if you have people who are motivated, then they actually want to do what they're doing. And it's a much less stressful thing to do whatever they're doing because they're actually wanting to achieve something. If you have a totally apathetic workforce who are really not interested in what they're doing, Actually, you, you're, 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 on, you, you're getting nowhere, you, and, you, and you, you, you can't even begin. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I don't work, work with industry. I don't know how it works. But if you are working with a group of people 
who have an aim, a, a motivation, they want to achieve something, they, whatever it might be, and at the end of the day, you know, there's some, they, they feel good about what they've done. However small it might be, it doesn't have to be anything major. I think that makes an enormous difference, and yeah. I think organisations need to think around how they can motivate their workforce. Yes. I do agree, this is obviously very important, and we know there are some employees who are known for their uh, ability to create a positive and supportive atmosphere at work, but there are many others who are at the completely different opposite end of the spectrum, I, and I do feel that a big change in, in, a, in a really meaningful manner can be executed only if there is a support in terms of public policy. We have achieved a lot in terms of uh, improvements in nutrition, thanks to public health nutrition. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We now yeah. at least know what we should Substance abuse and alcohol uh, uh, abuse is, is another matter very closely related to stress and depression, as you know, because at least 30% or according to some other data, 50% of people with uh, a addiction to drugs also suffer from mental health yes. problems, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to trace where is the beginning, but often people highly stressed and people falling into uh, living without sufficient support, bottling it up, reach for a alcohol yeah. or self medication. Mm, more absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's a huge problem. Yeah. It's a mental health problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we should, we should see it as a global problem mm, which needs to be, be embraced at very many levels. I agree, it's a matter of education. We, we achieved a lot again in terms of sexual education yeah. in school. Yes? The uh, prevalence of teenage pregnancy has gone down. Wonderful. But that is the outcome of effective uh, educational yeah. uh, program. We need to have it also in relation to mental health. According to, to what you said, completely agree. Teach young people about stress. Stress mm -hmm. is bad, stress is good. Uh, but it cannot happen uh, at random. Uh, I don't think we can expect individual organizations to, to deal with it locally. It should be, uh, it should be coordinated yes. and it should be supported mm. at the level of public. Absolutely. Yes. How feasible is it? Absolutely. It's sharing best practice. It's doing the right types of research. <coughs> uh, and yeah, I, I'm totally with you there. Do you think the government's emphasis on mental health is going to help at all with what you're talking about today? I don't think that's what they think that their focus on mental health is about. No. So, so how are we going to educate government? It's up to all of us. I mean, educating government, the only way we can do that is by talking to the relevant people, talking to your own, G to your own MP. And some of them are incredibly good. I mean, we actually have a very good one where I come from who is actually interested. But if you want to influence government, the way to do it is through your, your MP. Sorry, can I just, there's a question over there. Just maybe my response to that is, so there have only been two ever sitting prime ministers that have spoken about mental health, David Cameron and Theresa May now. So I think the conversations are beginning. And I think the more we have the conversations, the better we understand the issue. And the more we understand the issue, the better we find the right solutions. So I'm very, very hopeful that at least the conversations are taking place. So, yeah. So thank you very much. It's such an informative view. Thank you. I just wanted to, just on that point, that I, I wonder if there is cause for optimism, just on that very last point when you think about the commonality of this experience, yeah. when you think about yeah. where we were five, even five years ago, yeah. Yeah. and in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, it seems to me that um, it's almost like an evolutionary, it's like a burnout that we have to, we have to go through to, to get through yeah. and to, to, to think differently. Yeah. So mm. I don't know whether, yeah. what, 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 what people might think. Sorry, um, Going back to the point, I think, about, about you know, politics and politicians, leading by example is so incredibly important. But, you know, what, what do we do? We have 
the most important decisions made about our lives by a group of people who were least likely to be rested. You know, um, Parliament sits at night, people go off to hotels you know, from several countries and talk about things like NATO and they will sit up until maybe four or five o'clock in the morning uh, fueled by black coffee, you know? So that, that culture is, is there mm -hmm. and that, that kind of needs to be re-examined, the macho culture. <coughs> You know, because as a role model, it's not good. Yes? Governments in general respond to public pressure. Mm. <coughs> and I think it's absolutely clear that public pressure um, hasn't been backing um, mental health. And I, I um, tell us that the, the top 500 charities in the UK buy income. And of course, Cancer Research UK, Rich Heart Foundation, way up near the top, mm. one to five. There are hardly any charities that fund research into mental health. I mean, I know there's mind influence um, mm. in this sort of holistic thing, but fundamental research You're right. Health, charities mm. don't exist. It's schizophrenia, research funds in that. The first one I could find was the Mental Health Foundation, yeah. which has now gone bent with you. There you are. Um, and its income was actually a quarter of that of the Royal Opera House in Hong Wow. Now, that's simply a reflection of the general public mm -hmm. So if you want governments to change, it's a long haul to get the general public um, and the stigma we talked about. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's pervasive. Absolutely. And um, I don't think it's going to be much progress until we change that. Mm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my, uh, my, my question is, is for, uh, regarding the, uh, the, 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 the criteria of many, of, of, of many uh, job recruitment in which one is not just, I mean, the, the, employee, the employees of the board, uh, among potential employees, is the ability to Stress. I've been, I've been, I've been job hunting uh, uh, for, I mean, since I graduated for the past six years, and I've lost count of how, of how many job advertisements which contain uh, maybe the, I mean, those, I mean, the same, same advantage. So my question is, um, should 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 this uh, advantage more, uh, uh, be uh, normalized? I mean, uh, I mean, in today's um, uh, uh, job recruitment trends, I mean, or should uh, and, uh, should 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 employers, I mean. Sorry, can I, I just want to try and play the question back. Is the, is the question... Um, is should, should, it should be um, the ability to work under stress. Yeah. Uh, should, 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 it, should it be a, a, a norm to this job recruitment uh, uh, okay. uh, trend or something? Right. So should we be... The question is, you know, should we be evaluating people's ability to work under stress as being a criterion as to whether we're going to employ them or not? Actually, I'd like to ask the room, how many of you have been to a job interview and you've been asked that question? How good are you at managing stress? Yeah, so quite a few of you. But it's really difficult <laughs> to measure, isn't it? Because, of course, if you go um, for a job interview as a nurse or a social worker and somebody says, OK, how good are you at managing stress? Oh, I'm fine, because you want the job. But we need to have methods of assessing that that are less transparent. And there are, but obviously people need to be skilled enough, don't they, to be able to do it, you know, so, which of course goes back to um, school and skills, etc. But um, uh, organisations do need the right type of questions to ask, I think, and also give them the right type of support because people can't cope with a genuinely toxic working environment, no matter how good they are at dealing with stress. And sometimes that can be problematic because, yeah, yeah. Can I take a question right at the back and then I'll come to you? I feel like the guy on question time right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, just wouldn't that be more stigma on mental health? Like if you create a, a tool to mm. assess if someone uh, is capable to work under stress or not, that is supposed to be objective. Scientific, and it would be a little bit more stressed. I mean, 
Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And that is a big, big problem. Mm. You know, measuring resilience, measuring emotional resilience. It's a bit like engineering, isn't it? You know, you're a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're labeling somebody from the beginning. But the thing is, if, if jobs have intrinsic hazards in them, as some do, and you know somebody won't survive, like being a junior hospital mm. doctor, you know, they're, they're suffering very, very mm. badly at the moment. There's a lot of evidence coming up on that recently. Mm. And being able to survive that is really important. I, I think there's a real reality now, and I'm sorry to be a bit of a dampener, but I think there is a real reality that in the workplace today, whether you're in the NHS, whether you're in the prisons, whether you're in a big corporate, whether you're in a law firm, the demands on you are intense. Mm. And so therefore, you've got to learn to be able to cope with that environment. And that's where I come back to this concept of well-being and teaching people how to look after their well-being, how to look after their physical, emotional, mental. And we've got to teach people to be able to use the resources that are out there that allows me to better cope in these environments. Because those environments right now are really tough. And, and, you know, you're not going to survive if you haven't got these coping mechanisms that you begin to learn and to employ. And I think companies have an obligation to provide some of that, just like they provide training on how to do good presentation skills. They have an obligation to address some of these issues. Yeah. Yes, that should always be the number one. Yeah. You know, the best form of stress, stress management is prevention. Absolutely, 100%. There's a lovely saying, yeah. you know, if the flower doesn't bloom, it's not that there's something wrong with the flower, it's the environment it lives in. You know, in the research environment, one of the most important places in a high-pressure research environment is the tea room. And the people go to and they actually talk to each other. Yeah. And they talk to each other about all sorts of things. Some of it will be research, some things about other things. But that actually uh, is the most important room of the lot. Mm -hmm. And without it, you know, even your productivity drops. But people need to go there, don't they? That's yeah. the thing. And if they feel yeah. they don't have time or they're yeah. under pressure, they'll stop but going there. Oh, of course they are. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. And that's one of the things that's making it worse. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, yes, you've got a question. So, so the question is the, you know, the impact, the effect of kind of peer support networks in helping to alleviate and manage stress in the workplace. Mm -hmm. but, well, I think that's your area more than <laughs> okay. mine. Uh. Right, well, there's actually good and bad there because research that I've done with prison officers, now they have care teams and their care teams are comprised of fellow prison officers. So they were very reluctant, a lot of them, because obviously, you know, some of this, this support is good mm. quality, but quite a few of them were very reluctant to talk to their peers because, of course, under conditions of job insecurity, they were worried about disclosing to other people. Whereas peer coaching in other environments can be really, really valuable because you're with somebody who knows the job and it's not threatening and you can turn problems into solutions because you know so often we sit there and we whinge and we moan about work in a very negative way and you know that can make us feel feel quite happy we've got something off our chest but if we want to make a change we have to turn a problem into a solution and I have done some research on peer coaching and that it can be very useful indeed but again it's giving people time to do it um, you know and encouraging it and Showing people how to do it is the important thing. Are there any other comments, questions um, that you would like to, to ask? Yes. I know this is a bit of a tough question, but what is the best way to measure stress in the workplace, both physiologically and mentally? <laughs> 
<laughs> That's yours. So the question is, what is the best way to measure stress in the workplace? You can't. There are lots of things that we can do and fool ourselves when we're measuring stress. You do, we can measure your heart rate, we can measure hormones in your blood, but actually it's what's going on in your head and how you feel. Mm. And that's how you're stressed and you can't just measure it. Absolutely. It's, perception of it's your perception of stress which matters. Mm. Everything else doesn't matter. It's how you perceive the situation that you are in. That is what the stress is that's going to cause a problem. And yeah. you can't measure it by measuring your heart rate or measuring or clever hormones or anything like that. So the answer is you can't. A lot of people will tell you they can. And you know, you'll have people go around, oh, you know, I'll, I'll stick this thing on you and it'll tell me exactly when you're stressed. You can't. Mm. Yeah, uh, so it, it's interesting actually that research that has physiological measures and subjective measures from the same person doesn't necessarily have a correlation. No. You know? So. Yeah. Um, There's a question at the back, <laughs> or a comment. It's comparing light with light. I mean, I would agree with you, and I, I find it really worrying what the social media is and people only talking to their computer and not, not looking anyone in the face and having a conversation with them. And, you know, I, I can see this as a big problem. But, you know, if you look back to the Great Depression and, and you go home and there's no food at home and, and you've got an alcoholic parent and uh, the other one's beating up your, the other parent, I, I don't think you're on safe grounds to say that it's worse. It was really awful really, really awful, and we forget how awful it was. It's different. Mm, it's mm. different, certainly. Yeah. This is going to be the last question. Can I challenge Stefan on the, on the measurement of court not being useful? Because I was getting all excited about the measurement of court in hair, which gives you a long a view of a chronic stress. Is that... So the, the question was how you can measure it at a particular moment in time, I thought. And I'd say it, you can't measure it in time. If you want to, a measurement of a court in your hair could give you a, me, a, a measure, what it means I don't know, over the degree of stress you might have had over the last few months or something. It's not, I don't know what it means. It can show you that there has been a change in your experience over that period of time. But it was the acute measure of stress that I think that you can't do. Did you not remove the thymus gland? <laughs> 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 um, that would be a slightly unkind thing to do. It's the, the, the change in your thymus size is relatively small. Also, as you get older, your thymus gets smaller as well. So, you know, it, it would nicely work. But you, you want something that's responding quickly. Your thymus responds to your levels of cortisol in your blood. But as I say, it, it, it's small. And, and the level of cortisol in your blood and so your perception of stress are not necessarily correlated either. So, so don't let anyone take your thymus out because <laughs> it will give you other problems. So you need the subjectivity subjective and the objective together. Excellent questionnaires 
for uh, perception of stress, which is very important, or state and trait uh, each of the per personality and coping abilities, and resilience. And I think it's a multi, uh, multidisciplinary approach, a psychobiological, which yes. describes the situation best. Yeah. Yes. But we, we do measure. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that comment, and I am, uh, was charged with making sure that we at least end on time. I thought Alicia was fantastic at starting us on time, uh, on the dot of 6 o'clock. Uh, it's now 7.30. Um, I'd like to, on behalf of all of you here, I'd like to say a big thanks to Stafford, particularly for enlightening me a lot in terms of the mechanisms and the causes and how stress works. And I think to you, Gail, uh, for kind of just giving us, um, giving us a sense of, you know, what are those, what are those environmental stressors that are existing in the workplace? That if we want to help to reduce the levels of stress and reduce the levels of depression and anxiety in the workplace, where are some of the places we should go to try and create environments where people are feeling uh, unable to cope? Uh, so, on behalf of all of you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very informative presentations thank and thank, thank you. you for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much.